You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your favorite CCT personality, JTAC extraordinaire, embracer of the ridiculous face, and like the shortest operator you'll ever meet, Peaches. Hey everybody, welcome back to a One's Ready podcast. You're in the team room and we have a pretty awesome guest at a high level, I would say. Um, Of course, he will probably disagree with that. Um, But first, I want to tell you about uh, some of our friends. You guys are aware we we, uh, are friends with Hoist Hydration Drinks and then we are also friends with Alpha Brew. So if you guys are interested in them, go check them out. Uh, Promo code One's Ready will get you a discount. So... I, I mentioned we have a high-level guest. This individual is named Matt Parrish, and he is from SOCOM headquarters. So as high as you can get in, this, in the uh, Special Operations Force chain of command, he is, he is up there. Uh, it's actually where I came from. It was an excellent assignment, and I highly uh, suggest if you are in the SOF enterprise that if you can make it there, go there because it is eye-opening. Um, so Matt you want to give a little bit of uh, background on, on how you got to where you're at and what made you go the direction you did? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, <clears throat> first off, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, you know, uh, we all know Peaches. He's, uh, he's very optimistic. He puts a positive spin <laughs> on everything. So I love how he introduced, uh, you know, being up at SOCOM headquarters. It is a great tour, but obviously it's a headquarters tour. So uh, I know he learned a lot, as have I, uh, but it's definitely, uh, you know, he makes, he puts a nice rose on top of it. But yeah, my name is Matt Parrish. I'm a, I'm a SAR major in the U.S. Army. Um, I'm an Army Special Forces guy by trade, so Green Beret by trade. Spent my entire career in Special Forces, came in as an 18 X ray in 2003, went through the Q course, and then have continued to uh, be a Green Beret for the rest of my career. So about 18 years in, um, you know, was spent the majority of my career at Seventh Special Forces Group, first at Bragg, and then at Eglin Air Force Base, uh, doing both Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Central and South America trips uh, quite a bit. So uh, after that, I came up here to be a first sergeant, and and how that's a little bit different uh, from from you guys or your Air Force listeners. Uh, uh, the Army version of a first sergeant, sort of the uh, uh, the compilation of a superintendent job and a first sergeant job. So it's not just people, you know, it's also some mission and operation stuff as well. Uh, and then after that, I volunteered to come over and take POTIF, which is the preservation of the force and family, uh, which is basically our giant program to take care of our people across the SOCOM enterprise. So if you have physical therapists, if you have uh, strength trainers, if you have sykes, if you have uh, chaplains, all these different things at your area, uh, or if you're looking to go into special operations, you'll have these resources available to you as you get there. Uh, that's sort of centrally managed by our office, and we write the strategy and the research, resourcing and all that stuff and sort of, sort of try to figure out how we can best take care of our people. So uh, that's sort of my background. I'm married. I've got three kids, been married for 13 years. Uh, and I'm a family man and, and do a lot of things on the side, but I'm excited to join you guys. And then now uh, how we sort of got hooked up, uh, as Peaches said, we uh, we met while he was up here doing his headquarters tour. Uh, but I also co-host a podcast for SOCOM called Softcast. And we had Peaches on. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, I'm doing a plug early on it uh, that you got to come listen to Peaches because he was a great guest. But anyway, thanks for having me, fellas. I really appreciate it. Go on, man. I was I was gonna plug that in and tell me. Uh, at, lastly, you know why was I the best guest and you know who who <laughs> fell behind me? But yeah, whatever. <laughs> I had to cut a bunch of other people out, you know, and uh, yeah. you know just so we could make sure we had you in there. But uh, no, it was I a mean, great if we if, if we could be completely transparent, I was a I was a last minute ad. <laughs> Well, you'd been on our list in our defense. You'd been on our list for a long time, but you were sort of a guy that I knew had podcast experience. So it wasn't like a long lead time of like, oh man, I got to get this dude. Because a lot of our listeners, probably, or excuse me, our guests, probably same as y'all's, uh, this may be their first, like they're not used to being on a microphone, right? So we get, really got to walk them in, get them comfortable uh, because we're all quiet professionals. This is not really something that we seek uh, you know, limelight from, right? So it's not something that we're used to necessarily doing. So, uh, but no, Peaches was great. I'm, I'm joining you from sunny Florida uh, in my in my room. Peaches joined us from rainy Washington in his car uh, as we watched the sunrise in his sunroof uh, when he joined us on Softcast. But uh, it's a good it's a good job any, either way. So, uh, but anyway, I appreciate it, fellas. It's all good. You know, I want to like work the short list somehow into that conversation about the list of <laughs> anyway. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, but let, let's go back to, uh, if you don't mind, sorry, yeah. to the beginning. Please call ODA, me Matt. Please call me Matt through this thing, please. Yeah. I'm I mean, not I that call kind of I, sorry Major. I promise. I call Jared Chief just to annoy him. I know. So. I know. I know. Uh, but like it's, you're on an ODA back in the day yeah. I, and for people that don't know, it's about 12, 12 folks, but when you deploy, I think one of the things that people aren't tracking all the time is how many people get attached to your team, yeah. which can, can swell that. And obviously the best people to get attached to your team are the air force guys. And that's kind of where we come in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but from, from your perspective, what was, what, what is that like for your team when an air force guy uh, gets attached to you and, uh, in any experiences you have with that, you want to share with us about yeah. air force pros. Yeah, I love what you guys are doing in this podcast because I think it, I think it's super cool to to a be able to talk to folks that want to join, but also you've got folks in all all manner and, and parts of the pipeline uh, that listen in. So uh, I think you're absolutely right. It's not well publicized or or well known, I guess, uh, that we do have so many folks that attach. It's not something I was really thinking about or really tracking as I was going through the you know special forces qualification course or the Q course as we call it. It just wasn't something that was really on my radar. You know, you're in these you're learning your job or you're in these little like mock teams and mock ODAs and you're going through and you're sort of sort of the hallmark of special forces is like self-sufficiency, right? Like be put out in the middle of nowhere with just you and, and your team and be self-sufficient. So it wasn't really anything I was thinking about. It was like people getting attached. But then as I started to, to get in, um, you know, two special forces, I actually really enjoyed having Air Force guys attached to me. And I don't say that only because I'm sitting on the Ones Ready podcast. I actually have had great experiences. I've had a few turds, just like I've had plenty of turds on, you know, the, the SF side as well. Um, but I've had a lot of really good Air Force guys across both uh, combat controllers, TAC P's, uh, PJs, and uh, uh, special ops weather guys. You know, now obviously special reconnaissance. But um, it is it's interesting, right? Because uh, that to me is is a critical link. We talked about it a little bit when Peaches was on our show, like the ability to walk in and and build a brotherhood immediately. It's a tough job for you guys. You guys are basically new guys every time walking in. Now. Because you're sort of a you know a team member, but doesn't have to come in and completely be a team member in the same way. We usually uh, we're usually more open to you guys coming in than we are necessarily the cherry new guy who walks through the door because we do value your skills. Uh, uh, you know, I've said this a couple times on ours. Like we really do want another teammate, right? We we are more than happy to have more people to help us do the job, right? And because of the specialty that you're bringing, um, now fast forwarding as my years, you know, I was a team sergeant for three years and always had attachments, right? And so you guys were force multipliers in that I could pull one of my guys off of that duty because I had a specialist in that, right? So, um, you know, most of the time, because sort of our hallmark is self-sufficiency, we'll cross train on a lot of those same things. Right. So we'll have like, you know, we'll have our guys go through call for fire training and everything and go be, um, you know, um, sort of our level of a TAC P or ground air controller. Right. Or obviously we have medics, right. we have deltas for PJs and things like that. But with you guys coming in and attaching, that allows me to take what, what is that guy's like second or third job and hand it to somebody who it's their number one job. So I can get my green beret back to what his number one job is at the time. Uh, or I can have him do something else. Right. So it's really awesome to me. I've had, like I said, I've had some great ones, both in combat and in training. Um, at the beginning of my career, we would sort of just get you guys when we were in theater, right. As we rotated in, we'd get a, we'd get a new TAC P or a new CCC or whatever. And then as I moved into the crisis response force, we had habitual relationships with, CCTs, PJs, and uh, and SALTs, and now you know SR guys um, that would that would attach to us throughout our whole training regiment, which was awesome. Because uh, then even you got some of the same guys back. They knew your they knew your company, they knew your team, uh, and just really good working relationships with a lot of guys. And I think it's a I think it's a great thing. We usually have more than twelve anyway, so numbers is not a huge deal, right? Like I'm happy to take fifteen or sixteen Green Berets and then tack a couple Air Force guys. Uh, and, and be a you know eighteen or nineteen man. We get closer to like a a Marsoc team or a, or a SEAL platoon at some point. So, um, yeah, yeah. So you talk about uh, you know just kind of uh, a little bit more respect for some of the you older guys. Like you know if Peaches were to obviously attach to your team and he's been around that kind of thing, it's pretty evident whenever they show up to 
um, you know, your team and they know how to shoot, they know how to move, but there's always that little kind of butt sniffing competition where you're feeling everyone out, no matter how long they've been in, there's a person that may, you know, be at, uh, you know, a chief level or whatever, higher level that hasn't operated in a while. And you kind of watch the way they move, the way they talk, are they confident in themselves and are they willing to, you know, do whatever with the team where they kind of just hiding out in the room or, you know, cause there are those different kinds of people that attach to the team. Um, so what specific traits, whenever, uh, you know, a person is actually attached to your team, do you look for in, uh, you know, both a new guy for you guys, and then also a person who is actually attaching to your team from some kind of different force or whatever, what kind of things are you looking for to integrate them in? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big believer. And I say this often as I get asked these questions and I, I, you know, some of the same things that you guys are doing as far as mentoring new guys and gals that might want to join our force uh, in, in different MOS, MOSs or AFCs and uh, or AFSCs and rates. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that what makes a good um, soft person in whatever force will make them a good, uh, you know, whatever. So I'm a big believer that uh, what makes a good Green Beret makes a good SEAL, makes a good PJ. And that's really just being a hardworking, um, good individual, right? Uh, helping out the team, looking for work, and uh, and being really good at your own job. Um, I think that's what's critical. A lot of guys come in, they try to be uh, Swiss Army knives and worry about like, how am I going to integrate with whatever? And then they lose uh, sort of, you know, this is again, from my team sergeant lane, more than from my E5, E6 lane. Um, as a team sergeant, I'd have guys that come in there like, oh man, I'm going to help the Bravos and blah, 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 you know, weapons guys. And I'm going to always be in the cage and whatever. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate that. But I also need you to come up here and help me with this, uh, <laughs> with this task that you're actually yeah. uh, attached to us for. But I think being, you know, looking for work is critical. If you're ever the guy who's sitting there, uh, and it's just like, oh, well, that's not my lane. Um, again, we talked about this on Peach's lane. Like you want to be part of the team, right? So if you come in and then you're not helping in what the team is doing, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure right away. Right. And, uh, you know, it, to me, there is a little bit of butt sniffing that goes on. I, I'll widen it out outside of just air forces mm -hmm. or, or just air force attachments. Cause I had a lot of Navy EOD attachments as well. I even had some seals get attached to my team at different points. Um, so I've had all different, uh, you know, I've had all different jobs and, and different backgrounds attached to the team. And what made any of those guys a valued member of the team was just that coming in humbly, physically fit, ready to do their job, but humble, knowing their job and ready to work hard um, and wanting to be part of the team. Right. Um, not coming in and thinking, oh, I'm just here to, you know, uh, to work nine to five or whatever, like actually wanting to be part of the team. Yeah. And I think that little bit of apprehension is, uh, you know, very well deserved in that the course of actions that you're going to be taking as far as like the missions that you're going to be going on potentially together and all the things that you're going to be doing, because obviously you guys have been working together for a long time. There's this new guy that comes in and, um, you know, he's trying to integrate himself into the team. Obviously there has to be a little bit of trust because at the end of the day, you know, we're going to be watching each other's back and making sure that, uh, everything gets executed appropriately. And if you feel like you can't trust that person, then uh, it's going to be a bad day for them. You're going to have them sit up with uh, whatever, some with someone to watch them, some kind of babysitter or something like that. Yeah, uh, sure. So, you know, do you? Th I haven't. We haven't really talked about this in any of the podcasts before with any of the guests. But as far as um, you know, your selection versus the Air Force selection versus you know Navy selection. Um, do you think that alone, the selection portion gives you a little bit of trust in that person and how they are going to act or, you know, a person off the street, um, you know, do you value the air force training as much as your selection that you've been through? Do you see it kind of the same way and, uh, you know, trust the different forces to do that kind of thing to bring a qualified person that's not going to quit, that's going to do everything they need to when they're on the X with you guys, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. Especially at the level I'm at now, like sort of in the maturity of, of being this far into the game, I do absolutely trust, um, across all of those. Right. Um, you know, that that's built upon having great relationships and seeing demonstrated value from those folks that were assessed to select through your pipeline and others. I'll say that, um, the difference in sort of the air force pipelines, a lot of times just from my outside view, um, was a lot of times dudes were younger coming into it, right? Uh, it, coming in, being in, it's just a little bit younger um, a lot of times, at least it seemed like from the outside a lot of times. So the newer guys would come in 
would be, you know, 20 years old or whatever, right? That never really threw me off because I was a 19 year old guy when I went through 18 x-rays. So I showed up to a team as a 21 year old. So that was, you know, that wasn't weird to me, but like when I went, I went back to MFF military free fall later in my career and, uh, or about midway through my career and all the air force, uh, CCTs and everybody that was going through were like 18 years old, right? Because it's right in the beginning of y'all's pipeline. Cause I went through the Q course, RSFQ course prior to there being like free fall for all, so to speak, right? Like every SF guy, was not a military free fall guy. So I had to like pay my dues for years and years and years. Like that was something that I was like fighting. I want to go do this. Right. And I got it. And I'm like, damn, I wish we had it in our pipeline with these guys. And then sure enough, you know, they sort of did it at the end of our pipeline. So now everybody sort of goes through that, but I've seen um, uh, sort of what I alluded to earlier. I've seen um, great folks come out of every single one of those selection assessment, you know, assessment selection programs. I've seen a few turds that slip through. Um, and I think that's that's the nature of the beast. We sort of say that, you know, as you move up the rank, so to speak, in sort of tier level or specialty, it's just the percentage of turds go down. You know, you're always going to have people that, that are able to slip through. I mean, it's the truth. If you go into some of our special mission units, there are quote unquote turds in their opinion. Right. Uh, that guy might be a rock star two or three rungs below that. But against his peers in that in that spot, he's considered a turd, right? It just is what it is. But um, I think it's the same way to answer your question. It's the same way as I trust a new guy coming in, right? I trust that he's trainable. I trust that he has gone through whatever training uh, needs to happen for him to have that badge or that beret. Um, but you always have to demonstrate value, right? You got to own it and you got to earn it every single day. Um, I've got to earn my green beret every day, just like the kid who's walking in has got to earn his red beret every day. Uh, or the guy on my teams, you know, that's attached has got to earn his trident every day. Right. So there is, there is trust that's there inherent trust and you can either add to that trust or you can diminish that trust by your own actions uh, as you come in. Man, I'm just over here a little bit paranoid because I, I was out there with seventh group a couple times, and I'm like, is, is he talking about me? Am me, I the turd? Are you, are you that turd? <laughs> yeah. Can we get a list, quick. a by name list of Air Force guys that fit this category, so that I know you're not talking about me? <laughs> I don't think you and I ever. I don't think you were ever attached to my team because I, I remember I would remember at least face wise. Uh, but no, there's. There's a couple I can think of. I won't name any names on a uh, <laughs> on another podcast. Like yeah, this. we yeah yeah we won't well, dox anybody here. <laughs> I, I think one of the problems of being an attachment though is is every new twelve guys I meet, they're all like Matts and Brian's and Tim's. You know, yeah, like yeah. we try to like, keep hey, it easy for you guys. We only yeah, have like we, five names. You know, so I was like. Do you do you remember this guy? And I'm like, I don't know. Is this yeah. his name Matt? It might yeah. be him. Kind of tall, brown hair. Yeah, yeah, I right. Know guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 moving on now, though, you are the POTIF SEL. Yeah. Um, and for everybody out there that doesn't know what that means, I know every time we say POTIF, especially in like meetings I'm in, every once in a while someone will be like, "What does POTIF actually mean?" And we all yeah. kind of like look at the sky, like, yeah. "I know what it means, <laughs> but I don't know what it means." Yeah. Uh, so, can you just break down that program a little bit for everybody out there? Yeah. And it's a uh, because to me, it's just a, a, a nice mattress, you know, yeah. and, and physical therapist. But what, what is it actually there for and what, what do you do with that? Yeah, absolutely. So POTIF is an acronym for Preservation of the Force and the Family, or excuse me, Preservation of the Force and Family. And, uh, you know, it actually started as a different acronym uh, in 2010. Uh, Admiral McRaven put out like, hey, we're, we're having some fraying of the force, right? All the years of running and gunning since 2001, we're seeing these incidents uh, come up, you know, it's sort of similar to what we're what we're seeing that necessitated the comprehensive review, right? Sort of at that same episodic need to go back and reassess ourselves. So for this, it was the pressure on the force and family uh, task force that went out and did a ton of interviews. Some of you guys were probably still in the force at the time. Um, went out and did these focus groups, all these different things. And what came out of it, there was a there was a big, you know, sort of similar again to the comprehensive review. There's this big report that comes out, and there were a lot of things in there that, hey, we have soft specific needs because of our deployment schedules and because of our op tempo. And the, you know, remember this is 2010, height of GWAT. We've been running for almost a decade. Um, you know, we're we're banging in and out of these countries, and we're just you know, mission PMT, mission PMT, mission PMT, right? And so not that it's changed that much now, but that's why we're reassessing ourselves with a CR, right? Um, but so they came back and they said, hey, one of the things that we definitely want to attack from this is we want to layer on some soft specific funding to get access to care, 
uh, across these different domains to ensure that our folks have all the resources necessary to not just get them back and ready for the fight today, but to prolong their career. All four of us that are sitting on this thing, the military has dumped a millions of, you know, million or millions of dollars into our training. So which is better, not just for the country, not just for the taxpayer, but also for ourselves and our units, is is it better to go back and completely remake another Peaches and hope that he gets the experience to where he is now or to try to help him continue on uh, in his career? So the what, what that looks like, it used to be four domains that we sort of uh, that we looked at physical domain. Uh, psychological domain, spiritual domain, and the social and family domain. Last year, we added a fifth domain, the cognitive domain, and we can discuss that because there's a lot. I know in the team rooms, like, okay, psych, like why why a cognitive domain? What, what difference does that make, uh, et cetera? But as far as overall POTIF, what that means is we, we sort of have an umbrella program, and that's everything that touches our people, right? And so some of that is funded specifically through our office at POTIF, with P11 soft specific money, some of that is provided by the services, right? So your chaplain, if you're an Air Force guy, is provided by the Air Force, but it falls under the POTIF umbrella. Now, on the other side, your spiritual CPPNC, Community Peer-to-Peer Network Coordinator, that sort of helps that in that same bubble is funded through our office and funded through P11, right? So what that means is that Congress gives us incredible support and layers on about $90 million a year for this program uh, across all of our different spots. So here at my level, we're in charge of all of them. So it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, we, we write the strategy and policy and all those things for all of them. Doesn't matter if you're Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and doesn't matter where you are in the world. We're looking through with your leadership at what are the gaps? What's, what's an issue at your place? And how can we put manpower and resources there to try to help fill the gap? Uh, so that's what POTIF as a whole is. Yeah, yeah, and I think – I'm sorry, Trent. I, I just wanted to make a comment about, um, you know, when you talk about Congress providing that money, yeah. I think it's important to note that the funding for POTIF is not a guarantee every year. Nope. <laughs> like SOCOM, you know, the SOCOM commander, vice, all have to go and lobby for the, to Congress every year for this money to able, you know, to just the fun pot of it, it is not a guaranteed thing, which a lot of people don't understand. And, you know, the cost as we begin to add things to pot of the program, and you guys just talked about your, your adding a cognitive uh, aspect to it, which I am going to hit here in a little bit um, to dive a little deeper into. But I mean, all of this costs money. You know, it, there are some very generous people out there that have programs, medical programs that help people with TBIs and, and a lot of the cognitive stuff, which is amazing. Like, thank you to those people that are donating. But like for, for it to be an official program, uh, you know, a program or record, if you will, like all this stuff has to go to Congress every single year and get approved. So, um, I mean, no, that's 90 a great mil- point. Yeah, that's a great point. I'll, I'll just dovetail off of that. I mean, there's a, there's a specific reason why I just said that with, with how great Congress is, right? Because absolutely it is not a right. It's a privilege for us to get that money. Right. I was in SF, I was in soft before we had POTIF. Right. And what I always tried to relay to my guys as a team sergeant was, Hey man, uh, you know, uh, these guys, you know, if you look at, if you're watching it on video, you can see this massive scar on my neck from, you know, about six weeks post neck surgery, number four. Right. And so a lot of those issues started prior to POTIF. Right. And we had one physical therapist in all of seventh group. Right. And I could see that guy about once a month. Right. And when, when we went to physical readiness, as far as PT every morning, it was whatever your team sergeant's good at, that's what you're going to be good at, right? You get a team sergeant who comes in and he's a runner. That's what you're doing. There wasn't an analytical. You didn't have a guy who worked for Alabama and a guy who worked for like, you know, the Braves that now works for your area to be able to, to scope these programs for you and specifically dial in your physical readiness, right? And then once you did have an issue, your access to care was literally weeks. Now, if you're listening to this from our formation, you know that you've got, as I said, you've got a guy who's got either NCAA or professional experience that's helping you write your physical program. And if you do get an issue, because what we do is risky and, and there's risk involved, we mitigate it, but we're going to get injured, right? Uh, to get rehab on that and get you back into duty. I mean, if you're having access to care and you're you're not able to see a physical therapist for longer than 48 hours, we need to know about it, right? Because that is our standard. If you can't get immediate access to care, 
um, then then we're concerned about it. And we want to do something about it, right? So it's a huge difference. It's why I volunteered to take this job um, because I wanted to give back and hopefully keep somebody else, keep the next the next guy from not having to have four neck surgeries because he didn't have those resources. Yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important. And just for my, uh, so I can make it make sense to me and anybody out there that's maybe yeah. not tracking, the, the way that I saw it was we would train guys and we would start deploying them. And once you don't come out of the pipelines at like your peak lethality, you know, you're not the best at your job yet. So you'd see these guys kind of like get all this experience and hit like their 10, 12 year mark when they should be the best at what they do. And they are the, the, the brain and the body and everything has kind of come together. But like a lot of times guys are breaking at that point. Um, so that, I think that's why this stuff is so incredibly important. Um, it is not only to keep guys on team for longer, but then also to make sure that once you're done with your career, like you said, you're a family man, you want to be able to play with your kids and move around and all this other stuff. Um, and, and last thing I want to say about it is really, this is one of those things where us old guys can look back and say it was harder when we did it <laughs> than you young guys. That's why we're so grumpy. Um, <laughs> no, Trent, you so, make a great point as far as like readiness, right? Like in the old model, your physical readiness was super high when you came out of that came out of that assessment selection qualification course. Your mental readiness, not readiness, but sort of mental experience and sort of that side of your game was at its lowest, right? And so there's sort of this this dovetail where now as you get experience, your you know your mental readiness and, and everything, your ability to rely on things other than your physical tools continues to go up, right? Because you've seen these situations, you know how to sort of mentally and cognitively you know divide and conquer, right? But then in the old model, your physical readiness continued to go down, right? So you got to the end of your career where, to your point, you're as able to do all these other things as possible. You're so experienced in everything, but your body is just getting crushed from just re-attack, 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 right? So we're trying to plane that out where we know you're not going to necessarily be uh, a 19 year old, right? You're not going to, you're not going to feel like you were 19 running around, but we can get you as close to that as possible. Right. You'd also don't have to feel like you're 70, um, which is where I am at some days. So <laughs> I, I know how it is. Yeah, that definitely uh, is a huge factor. I mean, you look at some of the younger guys when they go and like they use the jaws or they do whatever, they're carrying their rucks. They're not really paying that much attention to their position, the back, yeah. the the way they're lifting stuff. And then you see the older guys, you know, it's like immediately set your back, go yeah. in there, make sure. So, yeah, that's definitely a learned skill over time. And I think it'd be awesome, you know, if, uh, you know, when we were younger, they heard, there's a little bit of attention played to us and make sure that we knew what we were doing in the first place like just teach us a little bit so i think that's a super important thing but uh looking forward in some of the initiatives and stuff that you guys are are doing for the future um are there any specific programs that you guys are looking at and then is there any way for you know the force out there that's involved or the people that are watching this that are looking to be involved can uh help with these kind of initiatives yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you should obviously you should you should have your POTIF uh, providers and and your resources at each one of your elements. I mean, go talk to them. Uh, don't just treat them as sort of uh, another squat rack in the gym that you just sort of see every time you walk in there. You know, go over there and engage those guys. They can really help you. I promise those guys and gals that nutritionist that's walking around. I promise you, uh, it's probably a good move to go in there and sit down with him or her and uh, and and check it out because you'll you'll regret it if you don't in uh, in ten years. Uh, but yeah, there's some great things coming down the line. I personally, as we talk about cognitive um, cognitive performance, uh, I'm the acting cognitive domain uh, program manager. So I run all that strategy, right? As we grew this thing, as we built this thing, um, you know, we're hiring a full-time person. We're waiting for them to start. But in the interim, basically over the last year, um, I got tagged, I volunteered. I said, hey, I, I'm all about this. I think it's super important. I'm, I'm really gung-ho to get this done because I have a lot of residual level blast and, and things like that, that, uh, that I think have affected me. So I certainly wanted to lend my voice and my credibility and my ability to help solve problems, uh, to try to tackle that. So one of the things that's coming down the pipe, and again, uh, I didn't know nearly as much about contracting and all these silly things that you learn at a headquarters until, uh, the last year, but now, one of the things that I'm trying to get that we're trying to roll out uh, across the enterprise is an app-based cognitive performance training plan called Brain HQ. It's commercially available. You actually download it from the app store right now. It's not something the military made. 
Um, I'll, you know, personally, I'd rather find something that's incredibly innovative and working great in the civilian world and then maximize and leverage it for our force rather than have than the military try to reinvent the wheel and it comes out clunky and inefficient and it takes twice as long. It doesn't work mm -hmm. as well. Right. So I'm all about finding the best solution. Go to it. Let's see if we can license it and let's get it in everybody's hands. So that's being used in a lot of places. It's being used in MARSOC right now. It's being used a little bit in NSW and some other places. Um, but that is something that I'm trying to get enterprise uh, licenses for. I'm trying to get a huge chunk of licenses for everybody across SOCOM to be able to go in there. And it's basically brain games, right? If you remember the old, like, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get sued by any of these companies, right? So there used to be one that used to uh, have commercials on all the time and it became sort of famous. So I won't mention the name. Um, but now, now, Brain HQ is actually backed by over 100 peer reviewed studies, right? It actually works, right? It's neuroplasticity, it's your brain's ability to create new connections, right? And so you play these brain games, and it has an AI based algorithm that basically keeps you training at the hardest level for you. So if the four of us are all playing the same brain game, we're all going to be at different levels of it, but we're all going to be learning at the same order of magnitude. Right. And so this literally from people in their 70s down to people in their in their teens shows the same order of magnitude um, increase across these cognitive skills. So what does that mean for you? It makes it means you can make better decisions faster. Right. It means that you're potentially using less of your brain power to make those decisions. Right. So that's something we call um, cognitive workload which is, um, you know, if, if I go up to some of our special mission units and I try, to, and I try to put a program in place to make them make better decisions in a shoot, no shoot scenario, how much is the margin of improvement available there, right? They're already the best in the world at it. So what can I really do to make sure that I'm helping them better themselves on that specific task? Well, one of the ways is that if Jared and I are both on that range and we're both making shoot, no shoot decisions, and I'm using 90% of my processing speed to make that decision, and he's only having to use 50%. Well, he's got 50, you know, he's got 40% then more CPU power to be able to be aware of other things in his surroundings that he's not having to use that I'm having to use. Right. And so sometimes it doesn't demonstrably show up in a specific line graph of how much faster you make that decision. Sometimes it does. If you if there's available space there for you to be um, sort of uh, to have a tactical skill gain there. But a lot of times it may just make you more aware and you have more. As I said, I, you know, I'm not a medic. I'm not a I'm not a doctor. So I look at it as like brain power, CPU speed. Right. If I'm running a bunch of things in the background on this MacBook right now. It, it's going to be really sketchy when I'm trying to talk to you guys on Zoom, yeah. right? So the more I can lower that CPU usage, the more we can use it for other things, right? So that's one that of the things bandwidth. that, well, yeah, bandwidth, exactly, yeah. right? We all deal with it, right? We all, we're all busy people. So when you go to make a decision, you want to be able to use the least bandwidth necessary to make the right decision as quickly as possible, right? And why, why, I, why I'm really excited about that is because I think it has a, a excuse me, applicability across every different MOS and AFSC and rate, right? There's not a single one that by using cognitive performance and getting better cognitively doesn't improve their position, right? It doesn't matter if you're a cyber guy in the Jimwick in the joint, you know, MISO Web Ops Center uh, doing cyber, uh, or if you're out on a range, um, you know, doing reconnaissance or you're out downrange doing reconnaissance on a target, right? Any of those can be better by your by your brain power uh, being faster, your memory being better, your attention being better, and all those things. So as we as we pivot again as a senior leader up here and all I hear about these, you know, moves to great power competition and all these other things, that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna win is in the human domain, right? So the better we can make our human weapon systems work, uh, the more we can use our decisive advantage in the human domain. Right. And when we when we talk about, you know, making people better, um, you know, a few percentage points can make a huge difference. And I mean, it's not going to be leaps and bounds like, hey, we're we're, you know, uh, opening up 25 percent capacity or bandwidth to be able to, to do that. Like that's probably unrealistic at this point. But, you know, if we can help somebody out by five percent, like, hey, that's a, that's a win. And I think that's a, a success in the, the eyes of SOCOM anyway. I, I would like to think, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not sitting at, at your level or your position, but yeah. I, no, you know, go for it, Matt. You, you'd be surprised at how much we can, at, like, so uh, yeah, we'll get real into this thing, but you know, uh, <laughs> uh, this is what I eat, sleep and breathe, right? Like you'd be surprised at how much better we can get just because you're really good. Just because you have something on your shoulder or on your chest 
doesn't mean you don't personally have the ability to be extra, extraordinarily better at those skills, right? And especially as we talk about like you've been doing it for a long time, you may be compensating with other skills to still be at that level. Um, you may be using different things or your brain is looking for patterns rather than actually taking in the information, right? Your eyesight may, you know, this is another perceptual thing when we talk cognitive is like your, you can start to lose your peripheral vision and things. And by using some of these cognitive performance, you know, training mechanisms, both, you know, whether it's brain HQ or some of the stuff that your actual cognitive performance specialists and cognitive en enhancement practitioners have in your unit, you can start to actually gain more SA, like literally more, more ability to see in your periphery through some of these things, through eye tracking and some of these drills. And suddenly it's not necessarily that we've you know changed your ability to think. It's that you now have either cleaner or more information entering the system, right? So garbage in, garbage out, better in, better out, right? So there's just a lot of different ways uh, for us to sort of attack this thing when we talk cognitive. No, and, that, and that makes sense. And, and I, I got to be honest, the, uh, when we started talking about cognitive stuff, I was completely in the, the TBI brain health realm. And that's just, and I think that's part of it as well, because, um, it you is, know, yeah. as you're aware, Admiral Zemanski has been a, a huge champion of, and the same with uh, Chief Greg Smith. He, I mean, they're, they love the, the whole brain health thing, um, you know, and uh, UVA just did something, you know, partnered with yeah. SOCOM in terms of doing brain health that I was involved in, and it was phenomenal. I phenomenal people. Did you go up there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, did. Another I did. One. There's only 10 of them. So now we've met, we got yeah. two out of the eight on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but absolutely. I mean, but I mean, it's great that, that you have somebody at, at, you know, General Clark's level, Admiral Zemanski's level that care about this. They recognize it and they're trying to do stuff to fix it, you know? So, um, you've, you've talked about, you know, opening let me, up and let me talk about make, that, whether you like yeah, it or not. I'm going to interrupt you because you made a great point, right? I'm going to interrupt you because uh, that's what kind of asshole I am. But the <laughs> Admiral Samantha, I meet with him monthly on this topic. We all, we as the cognitive domain come to him and talk about what are we doing this month to make our force better. And brain health is absolutely a huge part of it. So what I talked about earlier with cognitive enhancement is one line of effort. And then within there, there's like three or four lines of effort within just that, Right. But there's a whole nother line of effort, a whole nother huge chunk of this cognitive domain that is brain health. That's really why the cognitive domain got separated out in the first part. Admiral Szymanski was going up to Congress and he's talking about brain health and he's talking about TBI and he's talking about all these things that are happening. And basically some senators said, well, if it's so important, why is it not its own domain? And it was like, oh, man, maybe we do need to put more specific emphasis on the brain itself structurally and also how it perceptually and everything, how it's cognitively working. Let's take all these things that have sort of been working in the, in, in different silos and let's try to bring them all together to see if we can build some synergy. So is it where it needs to be yet? Not at all. Right. We're only about a year into really trying to push it all together, but it's something that we're trying to chew off every day uh, to make sure. But I think you're spot on the emphasis from the senior level does matter, right? We have these conversations in Congress, you know, I don't want to date this episode because I don't know when it's going to release, but General Clark is uh, is going to testify uh, to the Senate Armed Service Committee next week uh, to the SASC, right? And one of the things as we generate as a staff from each one of our sections is what major questions is he going to receive so that he can have the facts and figures and be able to, you know, say exactly what we're doing as a staff because you guys get it, man. At the top, He's, he's tracking all those things, but trying to answer specifics on any of those one things, like it's hard for me to do just for POTIF, much less a guy literally has every single thing in SOCOM uh, that, that he's in charge of, right? So we generate a lot of these things. And one of those things was in the cognitive domain and within brain health, hey, here's some facts and figures specifically about what we're doing to try to address these things um, because all of us are dealing with it, right? It's funny that you went to UVA, I went to UVA, um, you know, we're trying to sort of pay it forward uh, is at least the reason I did it. And I assume that's why you did it as well. It's like, it's probably not going to help me, but go up there and scan my brain, do whatever you need to do with it. Because if it helps the next peaches or the next Matt who's coming up, um, then I'm all about it. Exactly. Uh, that, I mean, it's an, 
that that's what we need to be worried about. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm one of the big proponents of telling people like the physicality is the foundation for the community, but it's what's between your ears that determines whether you're you're soft or SMU level or whatever else that happens. But if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't Trent, our A and S would be a PT test, right? If, yeah. if it really was only that, um, it would be yeah. Hey, like, do we use a lot of physical things in our assessment selection? Sure, but it's because we want to put uh, stress on people to see how they make decisions and see how well they actually buy into the team, right? Yes, the physical thing of carrying a ruck on land nav and the men- the tiny little bit of mental that it takes to make sure that you actually hit your point is important. But what we want to see is in the middle of the night when what you thought was the right azimuth is not, how do you respond to that challenge? Uh, right. And how do you, you know, yes, you can carry a ruck a long ways, um, but that would make ANS about three days if that was all we cared about was just physical, right? Across all of our it. forces, you know. I'm feeling it's personally like you... attacked by that azimuth. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you're gonna get canceled by everybody that hates land nav that struggles with it. You know, like they should want to. Uh, yeah, but as an attachment guy, you know, like I think if you show up and you're yoked and you're a super physical guy, that gets you about five seconds of credibility before they find out that you're a you're a turd. But um, moving forward to things that you like to talk about, you are the co-host of an official podcast under SOCOM called Softcast. First of all, I'm wondering how that happened because we had to do all of this stuff by ourselves. Yeah. So I'm just assuming that you guys, you know, just had an influx of money and they, they told you exactly what needed to happen and they got you the best equipment. <laughs> and now you guys just get to interview all the greatest people in SOCOM. Uh, kind of, Can you tell us how that came about or, or what you do with that podcast? Yeah, I'm trying to catch up to you guys, man, uh, in equipment and, and guests, man. No, we... Uh, <laughs> No, this is how it came about, right? Uh, really, the comprehensive review that I mentioned earlier, which is sort of the episodic relook of of our force, right? Um, born of, you know, a lot of things being in the news, right? I think we all, if we look at soft over the last couple of years, there was a lot of bad apples sort of in the news. There's a lot of bad news stories. And we know that there's, you know, even the comprehensive review itself and sort of the the big paper that was written and the report that was written after that, we realized that the vast majority of our force is doing incredible things, right? But the highlighted episodes, you know, the highlighted episodes are these terrible things, right? Or these, these implications of really bad things. Um, and so one of the findings was, hey, we need to find a better way to, to return some lessons learned to the force, right? And one of the first things, I think it was actually mentioned in the report, if you ever read the report, was uh, make a new magazine or something. And uh, and so well, we already have a magazine. It was sort of highlighted that the Navy has some like lessons learned magazine and that's what we needed to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't in I wasn't in these you know meetings to begin with. But uh, Teresa Kobel, our sort of uh, person who helped found in this podcast, uh, who was this, the communication office uh, SEO. Um, she was like, I don't think another magazine makes a dent in this, right? And so she sort of said, Hey, I think you know, podcasts are huge. I, you know, I listen to podcasts. I know a lot of people that do. Maybe that's an opportunity, that's a medium for us to leverage to do something different, to try to highlight some of our awesome people so that it's not just bad stories. And these awesome people that we're bringing on have incredible lessons learned across leadership, across resiliency, across all these things. Let's do it. Let's do it open source because we sort of batted it back and around. Do we do it on just our own internal network and make it just a product that's only available for people in SOCOM? And we said, no, I mean, we're, we're a product and we're a generator for civilians, right? We're a product of civilians and we're a generator because everybody in our force, God willing, who doesn't pay the ultimate sacrifice returns to being a civilian, right? And so we also work for the greater public. So why wouldn't we let, let it be available, right? It, it creates a little issue sometimes when I want to have a conversation with somebody who I know has a story that's incredible, but as sort of uh, not OPSEC uh, uh, cleared. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we talk around those things. I obviously talk to some people who work in some units that I can't really talk about what they do in those units, right? So we talk around it. I'm sure you guys are running into the same thing. But for me personally, for Softcast, uh, they came to me because, um, you know, I was in the headquarters as a Green Beret and there's actually there's fewer sort of operator types up there as Peaches knows. Um, and so they came to me and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this thing? And I said, absolutely not. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> and uh, it was like, what? What do you mean? Like, you're you know, at that time, I had been doing some narration for the paracommando, the parachute team and stuff. I said, yeah, but I, I, I'm not a spotlight guy. Like, I don't want I don't. 
I'm first of all, I'm not a hero, right? And I say this often, like I'm just a guy who did his job, right? And continues to do his job, tries to do his job well, right? I don't have some story like some of these cats that uh that I interview, like Nick Lavery, who loses his leg and fights back to being sort of the first above the knee amputee uh back in Afghanistan on a team, or John Alvarez who we just released, who lost his leg after crashing his helicopter into a piranha-infested river and then loses a leg and ends up back as the first, uh, you know, first amputee back in a combat flight, right? And so I'm like, hey, find somebody else. Find somebody who's got one of these stories. And they're like, hey, that's not what it's about. We need somebody to sort of run this thing and to and to sort of facilitate those conversations. We think you could do well on it. And I said, well, I tell you what, as long as I have some ability – to sort of form it and shape it and make it something that I would have listened to when I was on a team then I'm in. But if it's just me reciting talking points and basically doing public service announcements, I don't want any part of it. Like I don't want to, I don't want to lend my voice to it. And so is there some of that in there? Yeah, absolutely. We're an official podcast, right? But we really try to make sure that we're bringing uh, real guests to have real conversations um, and to really make it something, I understand that's not mandatory listening, right? We're trying to make it for somebody who's in the gym who wants to who wants to hear a cool story or wants to be inspired or wants to learn some leadership, uh, or if they're you know mowing the grass, whatever it is. I uh, try to make sure that it's somebody that I would want to hear from when I was on a team, and that the conversation is shaped around that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think all of this is um, really important as far as, you know, we're pretty aligned in our values and the way that we're trying to reflect the career fields. Obviously, there are a lot of negative yeah. stories that are out there, and that's sensationalism in the news. And we kind of expect that if they have a story to grab onto and put somebody in a negative light, it makes a lot of comments, that kind of stuff, and people are trying to protect each other, all that. But, you know, the more important thing is um, all the lessons learned over the last 20 years or so of um, war that, uh, you know, all of us have uh, been going through since 2001 and uh, that's really changed the face of the way we operate as an american military fighting force and um, the lessons learned you know if we don't capture them in some kind of way which now nowadays we have the avenue everyone can start a podcast everyone can uh, come on here and again you know the old mentality is like we don't want to put our faces out there for sure i mean none of us yeah. want to sit here and say look at me look at all the cool stuff i did so that's why we try to bring on guests as much as possible but <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that's what I enjoy about it, right? People write me and they're like, oh, man, how'd you get to be, you know, this is all blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, listen, man, it's not about me. It's not about me whatsoever. It's about the guests. And it's about shining a light on these incredible people that I'm blessed to work with, right? And and some of which I've known for a long time, some of which I just meet like you and I, you know, like we just met, right? Mm -hmm. But then I hear their stories and I'm like, man, there's so much that connects. Um, you know, I've been a, a listener of podcasts for a long time. Uh, sort of as it started, you know, years and years ago. And I've always found it to be valuable to be able rather, you know, I like to read. I enjoy that as well. But there's something about hearing from the person themselves and those stories um, that to me sort of helps me sink in because there's like little things that a guest will say that they don't even really realize, but it gives you that window into their perspective uh, that you wouldn't have if you didn't hear them say it. Right. And it's all, you know, not scripted or anything yeah. we, basically the way that we run all of our podcasts we have like basic things that we're going to yeah. kind of mention and then you know wherever it goes it flows and it's just stream of thought from the person that is talking and the person that's being interviewed and it's a great avenue for people to just get those lessons learned because again like you said there's certain things that um, like you're saying that you know maybe you didn't interpret as like a big deal but it changes somebody's perspective on whatever they're trying to get after. Um, so speaking about the guests, is there any specific um, uh, highlights from some of the topics that you discussed that you'd want to transfer into, you know, these people for our audiences, predominantly those people that are trying to get into special operations. We have some guys that are on team and everything already just trying yeah. to, you know, listen and learn some stuff as well. But um, are there any specific lessons learned um, from some of the podcasts, things that they can transfer into selection, that kind of stuff um, that you'd really want to highlight from the show and the people that you've talked to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, I'll say uh, again, I think I said this at the beginning, but I really like uh, sort of the focus of y'all's podcast, right? And I think I've even started pushing some folks that come to me asking about, uh, you know, joining soft, like, hey, I'm happy to mentor you, but also, hey, check these guys out. They're doing ones ready. It, they're doing a lot of Air Force stuff, but they're really, they're talking about things that are applicable across. And I know you guys have had uh, other Green Berets and other Navy folks and stuff on there. So I, I really do enjoy it. What a time to be alive if you're a, a guy or a gal wanting to go to assessment selection. I didn't meet my first Green Beret 
uh, until I was like, uh, I think already like already graduating basic. There was some cat who was like the 18 x-ray uh, liaison. And we saw that cat for like 20 minutes. And then the next time I saw a real green beret was when I was at SOPSI, our SOPSI one, our selection assessment, you know, our, our pre-course mm-hmm. for selection. And I thought we were just signing in. We, we show up, everybody's in jeans. We go sign in, we're standing there. And then we, this dude comes around the corner, like Rambo. And it's like, Hey, you have five <laughs> minutes to get in BDUs and be back where you're standing. Like we hadn't even unpacked stuff's everywhere. It was a, you know, and then they smoked us for like the rest of the day, but um, you know, drug us, drug us through the dirt. But that was like, I can't imagine uh, being uh, a, a soft, hopeful. Now the amount of access to information you have, to just sort of scope your mind and decide whether it's right for you and what you want to do and how you want to train. Like I was, I was reading Vietnam SF books uh, before I joined in the, in the 2002 timeframe. Uh, like that was just, that was all the information that was available. So I think it's incredible, but yes, to answer your question, there's a ton of incredible episodes. Like I, I haven't done one yet that when I finish, I'm like, Oh, that was only for the mic. Right. Like every single one, I'm excited. I'm like, man, if there was no mics around for whatever else, just like I grew for from it as a as an 18 year Green Beret, right? Like, there's never been a single one where I'm like, oh man, I wish we. I w- I'm glad we don't have more time. I guess you know, uh, every single one. I'm like, man, I wish we had more time. And we could turn the mics off. I just want to talk to this person, right? So, um, as far as assessment selection, one of the first ones we did, uh, which is not specific to soft, but I think it just goes back to be a good person, is Vice Admiral Szymanski, who we mentioned earlier, is a three-star Navy SEAL uh, admiral who's also from uh, Navy SEAL Development Group and has a very storied career, of much of which I can't talk about on an open source podcast. Um, he said when he was growing up, his dad said, you know, if there's three people in two brooms, be on a broom, right? And so that is good. That's good advice, whether you are uh, going to selection or whether you are a sergeant major or a chief, right? If there's three people in two brooms, be a worker, right? And, um, you know, that will that will be the difference in whether you're selected or not. I sort of, I, I uh, shout out to Hans and some of the other cats that I'm personally mentoring now, uh, uh, doing sort of the same thing that you guys do. Um but I almost am to the, to the point where there's so many people trying to ask questions all the time and everything else. I almost want to go with an answer of like, no, you don't get any answer. Just be who you are, because I don't want you to change who you are in selection that then I have to weed you out when you're on a team. I want you to be a really good person. And so if you're not a really good person, go work on that. Fix your character flaws and then go to selection. Don't fix your character flaws only for the, you know, whatever small amount of time that you're being watched, because that's not integrity, right? I want you to do the right thing when nobody's looking. I want you to be a teammate no matter what. And I want you to work hard no matter what. And so, yeah, there's incredible guests both for, you know, we shape our force. I know y'all's target audience is more towards like folks that are thinking about going to soft. And I know you got some folks in the in the pipeline and, and on teams that listen. We kind of take the other side of it, right? We're, we're trying to hit folks that are on teams right now, but we know we have some folks that are sort of listening as they're going up, right? So a lot of what we focus on is leadership specifically, which if you're thinking about going into the Q course or going into some sort of assessment and selection, you, you're going to be a leader. Like if you become a soft guy, you're a leader, a soft guy or gal, you're a leader. And it doesn't matter if you're, you have the most rank in the room or not, you have a sphere of influence and how you act. Um, Sometimes peer-to-peer leadership is just as important, if not more important than top-down leadership. So uh, honing your craft as a leader is always important. And we've had some incredible ones on. And then a lot of what we highlight as well is, like I said earlier, just resiliency stories of some of these folks that have fought back from such high odds that it will humble you and make you remember that if you're running around with two good legs and you're complaining about how they hurt because you're you know, squatting or whatever else, it'll humble you, right? Like if you ever feel like you're really great at this, listen to some of these people that we have on our show because it humbles me every time I talk. I'm like, golly, like I am so blessed to have all these, you know, advantages and I still am not putting out as much as that person is. Um, and so I'm inspired every time I get to talk to somebody like that. Um, and, and like I said, some of these leadership, the one we're about to drop on Tuesday, again, I'm dating this episode, but I'm, I'm in the editing process right now. We had a guy named Dr. Preston Klein 
who's a fellow, he leads this thing at Wharton, right? At Wharton School of Business about management, right? And he's, uh, he's been, he's the only man to believe to be the only man who's ever been and seen parts of every single one of the assessment and selections across, not just our force, but all of the five eyes. He's been a, he's been an educator and a consultant to each and every one of them, right? And his thing is, he really tries to shape cadre um, because cadre beget good, uh, good studs, and that begets good teams, right? And so his focus is all about teams. He's been in our formation enough to have some very pointed things towards what is going right in our formation and what's not going right in our formation. And I, I'm telling you, I put this on my LinkedIn or something the other day. Like, if you're a leader, you this is one of those few ones that you're literally going to have, like, the green notebook, and you're just, like, scribbling things in it. Like, holy cow. Mm. Like, literally, Greg Smith, the command senior enlisted leader of SOCOM, I tried to throw it to him at one point. Like, I left that pause in our in our thing, and he was too busy writing notes because of how <laughs> good this guy is. Like, it's incredible, right? And I literally, I'm, like, looking. I'm, like, Chief, you, you, it's your turn. You're going you're gonna to get in there? No, no, okay. And he's, like, sorry, I, I got to finish that thought because it was so important to him that, like, I'm going to use this as I'm going out and that guy's been in for 32 years. It's you know an incredible leader. All these things, but he's he's furiously scribbling down notes because this guy, uh, Dr. Klein, is just all over. It's one of those guys that when you listen to him, you're like, I just want to go follow this guy around like I'm a Grateful Dead, you know, deadhead, and listen to this guy whenever he talks. But yeah, there's some awesome episodes. And again, um, the good thing about podcasting is like we can promote your show. You guys can promote ours. We're not at time slots where like if you listen to mine, you can't listen to ones ready. Like now, if you've got time, you know, uh, there's there's so much awesome content. What a time to be alive. Um, and there's so many people willing to help you uh, if you're a prospective soft you know, guy or gal that I can't imagine if I would have tried to like reach out to an actual Green Beret when I was thinking about joining or going through selection. And now you literally have that opportunity at your fingertips. Like I get DMs all the time. Uh, about those things, and I'm always happy to help or, or get on a phone call with somebody. Well, that, so. was, that was well before social media. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, if you're like handwriting a letter or something, or if you yeah, found yeah. somebody's name, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you brought up Chief Smith, and, um, you know, I, I wanted to throw this out there. I actually had a different question before we wrap it up, but uh, since you brought up Chief Smith, um, you guys have a, an interesting dynamic on your podcast, and and yeah. I I like it because you're you're definitely put into a difficult situation, and I and I certainly felt that uh, <laughs> at least when I was a guest on there, because I, I mean he is the command SEL. Yeah. I mean, like if he wanted to, he could absolutely crush me. Yeah, you and know, me. Yeah. just and you, right? Yeah. I mean, just end us yeah. right right then and there, snapping the fingers, yeah. right? And um, yet. I dig it because you guys are able, and I've heard it on on some of your other episodes. Like you guys will vehemently disagree. I mean, there is no movement on either side because you have your perspective, he has his perspective, and they are two different perspectives. I mean, yes, you yeah. are at the t- you are at the top of the you know you're an E nine, you're a sergeant major in the I'm army. Much more a team guy, and that's right. and that's where I come at it from. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and and um, so it's it's. Awesome to see that, that that dynamic, and I think it's healthy, and I and I like the way you guys are fostering that, and and knowing knowing Chief Smith fairly well, like he appreciates that too. I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear it from you. Uh, I think you appreciate it more than he does. No, so yeah. what Jared's alluded to, what Peach is alluded to, is like we argue, right? And uh, yeah, I actually commented on this a couple of times with some of my friends as they listen. You know, as there's like, hey, I just found your podcast. You know, blah blah blah. They're like, dude, you're arguing with the SOCOM CSM, right? And uh, he's like, that's uh, that's a pretty ballsy move. But I mean, here's the deal. To me, um, it, it helps both sides, right? Because some of these some of these topics we're talking about are controversial, right? And where I differ from a lot of others is that I'm not really a SAR major. I'm a team guy who skipped all the other steps and ended up at this strategic level, right? So I, my, my thoughts and, and sort of the pulse of the force to me is still in the team room. And so... For Chief Smith, it's not that he doesn't have that, but he's been in so many strategic leadership levels since then that it's hard because whenever he goes somewhere, do you guys just let him walk in the team room and be one of the guys? No, you know he's coming and your leadership has shoved it down your throat that everything's going to be perfect and scrubbed and whatever because him and General Clark are coming. So how then does he find out the actual salt of the conversation? Right. And so when we talk about diversity or we talk about women and soft or we talk about whatever it is, um, 
it's my job to insert that point of view. Now, there is always a power dynamic there. Am I going to be absolutely like <laughs> flip the table? Hey, you're wrong and dog cussing him. No. <laughs> but the thing is, if it's the right answer, right, then then he's then able to argue it to me. And then if you in the team room, a lot of times I take devil's advocate. It's not necessarily that I personally believe that way. Um, but if I'm hearing it from the force, I'll oftentimes bring it up. Right. And so then if you as a as a listener hear it and you hear me bring up your perspective, then you hear the answer. To me, that's better than if you only hear the talking point. And then you as a listener, you're sitting there like, well, what about X, Y and Z? Right. And uh, and and it never gets answered. Right. So I try to bring some of those things. I have people send me stuff like, hey, I hear you guys talking about whatever. And a lot of times I'm actually really believe on his side at sometimes because I have I have had these conversations behind closed doors. But it's not something that we necessarily talked about before. So uh, that's why there was a it was an interesting sort of power dynamic as I started openly arguing with uh, with Chief Smith on some of these episodes. But when we do those shots from the field things and we have people send in questions, I don't want it to be just be like, OK, we're all just going to say the talking points like our show should be something different than you hear. Uh, that you hear if you went to like an all call with chief Smith, if he comes to your unit and you hear him talk, you're going to get his perspective. If you listen to our show, I don't want you to just hear the exact same thing. And you're like, Oh, it's just talking points. There's no actual salt to this. So, but yeah, it's fun. I'm uh, I, I will get a pink slip at some time uh, at some point for it, but there's no E10. So I guess I'll just go back to E8. Or something. Exactly. Uh, well, then I'm, I've got to take this opportunity to say, Hey, chief Smith, since I know you're going to listen to this, cause you, you're, <laughs> you listen to ones ready all the time. Uh, you're, you're coming on next. Like that invite is, is always he's over all to him. about it. Yeah. He's so, all about it. I actually talked to him before I was coming on and say, Hey, do you want to do together or do you separate? Um, you know, it's been awesome to me, you know, obviously that's, that's a position you don't talk to like ever. Right. SOCOM CSL, you don't talk to that position. Right. I never, I'll be honest. I didn't know who the SOCOM CSL was half the time when I was on a team. Right. But I knew if he came around, I definitely wasn't talking to him if I didn't have to. Right. Because, you know, it's just like, Hey, I, I don't want to be involved. Right. And so even when I got up here and I was the first sergeant, I was working for Pat McCauley, you know, I, I'll just stay over here. That's still, you know, that's still right hand to, you know, Gerald Thomas at the time I, I, I'm over here. Right. But those guys don't get there on accident, right? They're no. they're incredible leaders. And if you sit around, you actually get a chance to engage with some of those folks and you actually get to hear some of their perspectives of not just what they're talking about now, but the lessons they've learned over their career. Like if you've never heard Greg, Greg Smith talk, he's one of the smartest guys on earth, especially strategically. He, he is smarter on doctrine and strategic uh, vision than, than a lot of field grade officers and general officers. I mean, the guy, uh, histori- he's got every history thing of why all these things happened. And it really helps me shape the perspective of why we go forward uh, in different ways. And it's incredible. It's an incredible opportunity for me to sit across a table from him and hear what he injects on some of those podcasts. I learned just as much from what he's bringing from his strategic foxhole as anybody's learning from me bringing the, the team room foxhole. So I'm, right. I'm very appreciative, you know, appreciative to be able to get a chance to just be on the show and help, help uh, shine a light on some other folks' stories. Exactly. Well, Matt, I just want to wrap this up. I appreciate you coming on uh, from the entire One's Ready crew. We, I mean, you've been an awesome guest, and I think that you have provided quite a few little nuggets, especially from you know an ODA team sergeant perspective on what you're looking for, what you want to see. You know, be a worker. Don't just be an attachment on a team where you're just yeah. doing the bare minimums. Like you're you're getting into it. You're doing work. You 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 see an opportunity to work you go do it and so we we really appreciate that and i and i hope the listeners take that to heart and and action that appropriately so again thanks for coming on and if you guys haven't seen it already go check out socom's official podcast the softcast and we are out here see you later thanks guys appreciate it